desideratum is a Latin word, meaning things that are desired as essential. The Desideratum podcast celebrates the art of telling and the journey of listening to stories with narrator Teresa Bakken and her author, artist, and wordsmith, Friends. Episode 6, Voices. There is a, a solace in human touch that, that, that we cannot replace any other way. That is Mary Lee McDonald talking about how touch is essential for well-being. Today's featured short story is from her collection, Body Language, 12 Unforgettable Portraits of Heartbreak and Desire. In it, she makes these great connections to place, how we feel and react in our surroundings. All of my writing is very centered in place. Because a lot of times people aren't just responding to their inner world, they're responding to some kind of stimulus from the outer world. Mm -hmm. And they're feeling either um, comfortable in that place or very uncomfortable. You know, it's a place that they might know well or else they're in a new place and they're having that anxiety that we all have when we're in a place that we don't know. We don't know the street signs. I, I love putting people in foreign places because mm-hmm. then they are taking in all of the information for the first time. I think that's a really great point that you're making about place and how we behave differently when we're not in our rooted place. Yeah, I think it's because uh, I often feel just as a person either misplaced or displaced. And this has to do with my adoption. I was adopted as a baby and and I've actually spent a great deal of my life trying to put down roots. And that's, and I, and I write about people who have that same feeling of um, not quite belonging there and not knowing how to belong, how to join in, how to read the street signs, how to, how to read the map, the emotional map not just the physical map, but also the emotional map of where they are. There's a story in when, in the body language, the last story that is um, about a, a woman composer who goes to Austria, to Vienna. That's the story that we're going to feature today. Voices is what you're referring Voices, to. Voices, yes. Yes. Uh-huh. When I was reading it, There's a part of it, and and she is a composer. She's struggling with her creative process. She's been recently widowed. Um, Yes, her widowhood has shut down her ability to compose. It has locked locked her creativity inside inside a, a bubble of depression and grief. So that image of locked creativity is a perfect place to start the featured story. How the composer's creativity becomes unlocked is my favorite part. After you listen to the story, we'll pick back up our conversation. Not only was Mary Lee adopted, as a teenager, she also surrendered a son for adoption. What she has to say about nature, nurture, and love is stunning. First, I'm thrilled to have her audiobook narrator, the talented Adam Barr, reading her short story about a composer. Voices. A year after she had buried her husband, Neva Roth sat in a Viennese rehearsal hall, listening to the piece she had dedicated to his memory. A mixed chorus of men and women packed tight on risers erected in a semicircle behind the orchestra, sang a modern version of a Gregorian plain song chant. The choir could handle her kind of avant-garde music. They sang Schoenberg, for heaven's sake. But in the orchestra, the percussion section sounded like waiters dropping trays of crockery. A bassoon belched out low groans. Piccolos scratched glass. 
There was no unity and no beauty, and it was because of the conductor carving mountains with his baton. She put down her copy of the score. Hold on a minute, she said. Herr Lautner, wings of wild hair above his ears, glanced back. Yes. Neva approached the podium, expecting to be given a hand up. Tall and elegant at 72, she had paid her dues and was rightfully entitled to every courtesy. Sit down, Frau Roth, Lautner said. You're not interpreting the score correctly. She turned to the orchestra and made a fist. I want from the heart. Then to Lautner, sotto voce, she said. They're playing mechanically. Why don't you try directing without the baton? Hands up like a ballerina, she traced a heart in the air. Madam, in all my years of conducting, I have never had a composer tell me how to do my job. But you seem stuck in the middle, Neva said. I am not stuck, madam. This is my method. But spontaneity, please, madam, enough. His baton clattered to the floor. No one took a breath, not the musicians waiting tensely to go on, nor the chorus. As a gesture of conciliation, she picked up the baton and handed it to him. He tapped the podium and raised his arms. Sweat darkened his armpits. The rehearsal space was not air-conditioned. What's wrong with you, Neva, she thought, settling back into her front row seat. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Some conductors preferred to work alone. Indeed, she was one of them. Maybe he'd been forced to invite her to rehearsal. She was well known in New York, but a stranger here. Tomorrow was the debut of Falling in Flight, a tone poem based on the legend of Icarus, Happy Icarus soaring on his wax wings toward the sun, and terrified Icarus when the wings melted. She desperately needed Lautner to get on board. But on board how? Should she talk to him? Try sending an email? She thought she had given him enough guidance before rehearsals began. However, maybe it wasn't him at all there was a good possibility that the piece itself was flawed. For months, she had tried to create new work, but Martin's death had disrupted the twilight sleep from which her music sprang. She was having trouble contacting her heart. The breath and flesh and voice that went into her compositions withered by that last glimpse of Martin's face, powdered and peach-colored. Something within her had shriveled, her daring, her boldness, her belief that in the face of life's great events, music mattered. But of course it mattered. Otherwise, why had she decided not to have children? Why else had she thought the sacrifice worth it? Wrung out by the humidity, Lautner's refusal to accept an apology, and the U-Bahn's rush-hour crowds, she rode the escalator up to street level. A bad rehearsal would not matter if the concert went well. She wanted the piece played exactly as she heard it in her head. Pension Aklon on tiny Dorotheergasse occupied the top floor of an old apartment building. From the foyer, a marble staircase spiraled up and around the open shaft of a birdcage elevator. Neva's euro in the coin box brought the motor to life. She got in, punched the button for her floor, and the elevator glided up, pulleys shrieking to the sixth level, where it jerked to a halt inches below the landing. Almost home, and none too soon. The concierge, a heavy-set, middle-aged woman with features elongated by a severe bun, greeted her in the hall. A Herr Hoffmann left a number for you to call. I don't know anyone by that name. Neva took the hastily scribbled message, crumpled it, and stuffed it in her pocket. Probably some flunky of the conductors. In a room where lace curtains covered the open windows, she unpacked her suitcase into the walnut shrunk and thought how proud she'd been to receive the commission. Martin's family came from Vienna, 
and she'd been dying to see it for years. Now Lautner was putting his autocratic stamp on her work. But what could she do? Nothing. On the far side of the bed, she spread out Martin's red nightshirt, arms akimbo. The nightshirt had the well-loved appearance of Martin himself, bear-like in girth. Forget dinner. She threw back the duvet and kicked off her heels. If she could just get some sleep. The phone jangled. The concierge. A Herr Hoffmann awaited her in the breakfast room. Neva slammed down the receiver. The conductor refused to speak with her in person and now sent his minion to tell her what? That her work was atonal? Too difficult to play? Down the hall, a crystal chandelier hung above eight round tables set with crisp white linen and gold-rimmed china, but the room was only used in the morning, and the man who sat reading the pages of the Wiener Tagblatt sat in virtual darkness, the paper held high to capture what little light came from the alley windows. He was impeccably dressed in a khaki suit. His long legs were crossed at the knee, and one thin-soled Italian loafer bobbed evenly, as if he were keeping time to a slow internal metronome. You woke me, she said, rather coldly. The man folded his paper, slipped his reading glasses into a breast pocket, and stood in one smooth motion. Before she could withdraw her hand, he pressed it to his lips. When he straightened, she saw that his face was tan and weather-cracked, his eyes merry. He was quite handsome. Pleased, but puzzled, she regarded him. Gnädige Frau, I see you do not have the slightest idea who I am. Should I? We met in Salzburg, he said, his voice a pleasing tenor. Didn't the conductor send you here? No, no, we met in a beer garden. Ah, yes, now she remembered. Half a dozen Austrians, all her age or a little older, had taken seats at a nearby outdoor table, and over beer and pretzels she had told them about her commission. Were you one of the music aficionados from Vienna? Exactly, he said, pulling out the chair to his side and gesturing for her to sit. When I saw the poster advertising the Schoenberg concert, I remembered you. Oh, the concert, she groaned, sinking into the seat. I committed a faux pas and practically got myself booted out of rehearsal. Do you not remember me inviting you to accept my hospitality in Vienna? In America, that kind of comment is never sincere. No? but many Americans say to look them up if I ever return to the States. You'd better not, Neva laughed, for the first time in ages. They'd be surprised. But I am Austrian and meant it. He smiled broadly and handed her a business card. She ran her thumb across the raised engraving. With her rusty high German, she translated the words. Offices, renovations, restorations. What are you, an architect? Architect und urban planner, he saluted, with a degree from NYU. How did you find me? A friend in the choir told me where you were staying, so I tracked you down. Well, then. The concert is sold out, he said. Sometimes a loose ticket is floating about in the director's pocket. Perhaps you could ask? I wouldn't dare she said. I apologize, he said. At this late date, you and Herr Lautner must have VIPs to think about. Herr Lautner doesn't confide in me. Oh, a bit of trouble with the maestro? He doesn't seem to have a feel for the piece. It's torture watching him rehearse. Herr Lautner has a reputation for being, shall we say, overly methodical. I'm actually relieved to know that. I thought he was either clueless or trying to purposefully sabotage the performance. Today's rehearsal wiped me out. Then I'm sorry for bothering you with my ticket problems. You must want to rest. He folded the newspaper under his arm. I'll get out of your hair. Wait, she said. 
I have an extra ticket. The one they had sent for Martin. She hurried to her room and got it. When she returned, he was waiting in the hall. Then you must allow me to reciprocate and show you Vienna. Are you free the day after tomorrow? Yes, certainly, Herr Hoffmann. I'd be grateful for the diversion. Please, call me Otto. His move toward familiarity caught her off guard. All right, Otto. There was a post-concert reception. Realizing it might be awkward to abandon him, she invited him to come, and he accepted. Neva slept through the morning rehearsal. Not jet lag. She wished it were. Even in New York, she often overslept, made early appointments, and then forgot to set an alarm. She called the choir's secretary and lied about a migraine. Seeing Otto's card on the nightstand, she dialed his number. Did we arrange a meeting place for tonight? Not yet, he said. Why don't you meet me for lunch and we can fix un rendezvous? His easy transition to French was delightful. Something she and Martin used to do. Eat dinner in French. Read Rilke auf Deutsch. Sing Portuguese ballads like love-struck bohemian poets. She dressed hurriedly in a casual suit and over-the-knee boots, and rushed downstairs to a café at the corner of Stevensplatz. Several minutes later, Otto came toward her. He was taller than she remembered, and carried a cardboard tube beneath his arm. Wind blew loose a red placemat. He snagged it from the air and then sat. While he studied the menu, she saw that his nose canted to one side, giving his face a pleasing asymmetry. The humidity had dropped and he looked terribly healthy in his crisp seersucker suit. She agreed to the Riesling he proposed and ordered the first salad on the menu. The waiter returned with the wine and a silver cooler. Wine would be good, she thought. The concert would keep her up late. She could use a nap. You mentioned you visited the States, she said. After the war, I worked as a draftsman in New York. A draftsman? Do they have those anymore? No, the whole profession has changed. When was this? I went in 53 and came home in 58, then lived like a pauper on my wife's teaching salary. It was ten years until I received the commission. His eyes skipped across the parapets of buildings. Vienna was rattling with pensioners and amputees. Now it is a young person's city and I am ready to retire. You look too young to retire, she said. I hike every weekend. I like to hike. Where? The Adirondacks. Ah, the Adirondacks. I used to hike there, back in the days before ticks and Lyme disease. Why did you return to Austria? He turned toward the plaza. To repair the rubble. But the city looks perfectly preserved. The facades are the same, but we architects made new everything within the historic shell of the past. The shell of the past. Her skin tingled. She knew about that. How wonderful. Respectful. Eating her salad and drinking her wine, she thought, I am truly enjoying myself. Food. Conversation. How long it had been. After the meal, Otto walked her back to the pension. So, shall I pick you up here? Otto said. Thank you, no. I need time to gather myself. I'll see you at the venue. Coughs ricocheted through the hall. The orchestra shimmered in the bright rectangle of the stage. Neva, a white swan in red satin and diamonds, came down the aisle to the front row. Otto, in a tuxedo, had arrived early. He stood and greeted her with a bow and extended a hand to help her to her seat. She knew they made a handsome couple and couldn't help a glowing smile. The choir, dressed in burgundy robes, filled the risers. Herr Lautner strode across the stage, tuxedo tails flapping, hair slicked back with pomade. Stepping onto the podium, he raised his baton. The choral piece, falling in flight, 
began with the brass establishing a theme of rising fourths and fifths, speaking directly to the musical subconscious. One by one, the woodwinds, strings, and voices joined, a happy jamboree of sound with a single underlying conversation. Neva had written the score without measures and marked each musician's sheet music count to ten or count to five. Her music went to the very core of the musician's art, natural breathing and a sense of phrasing. A professional, especially a Viennese, was more than an instrument with a foot tapping out 4-4 time. As she watched the conductor, she felt an intense longing to direct her own piece, to wade hip-deep in the ocean, making herself vulnerable to the next big wave of sound. She wanted to be knocked flat. When the harmonics changed, the tenors, altos, and sopranos assembled in the layered ooming of Tibetan monks. Wow, 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 vibrated through the grand zal. Bringing both arms down in a violent thrash, the conductor halted all sound. In the silence, the air rang with a tinny, whispered vibration. So far, so good, she thought, nearly euphoric that the tricky middle had gone well. Settling against the seat, she slid her elbow back on the armrest and felt Otto's shoulder. Not wanting to be distracted, she pulled away. In the final third, the strings and voices traded chants, calling across a chasm. To her horror, Herr Lautner's arms jerked up and down. The freewheeling tumbles stopped. The orchestra marched to his tempo. The end stunk. There was applause, appreciative, but not a roar. Otto clapped heartily. Sehr gut, wunderbar. Danke, she said, acknowledging the false praise. The disappointing end took her back to Martin's funeral, the dim yellow light filtering through the shades, the flowers shedding seeds across her desk. While her mother and sister fielded phone calls from friends and colleagues, Neva sat at her desk with the score of Figaro propped against the wall. But this performance had none of Puccini's sparkle. Her composition was flawed. She had feared it. Now she knew, and she must face the final humiliation, congratulating the conductor. At the reception, the prongs of Otto's fingers steered her through women in evening dress, beaded bags clutched to their bosoms, and tuxedo instrumentalists sipping champagne. This happy clamor was the effect she'd wanted. As she approached the conductor, he looked her up and down. Frau Roth! Delighted you could join us. Herr Lautner nodded at a ring of men. I believe you know everyone? The head of the music school, Herr Dr. Witz, whose mustache style had surely been lifted from the era of Franz Josef, offered his congratulations. He gave a sideways glance at the conductor. Very challenging piece. The idea came from Puccini, she said. Yes? said Witz. I would have thought Britain or your famous Eastern influence. No gamelins, she said. No ten-tone scale. She looked around for the Schoenberg's music director, an ally, but he had disappeared into the cliques of mostly gray-haired men. By God, was she going to have to justify her composition? Yes, she was, and she would. The balance between abandon and control. Ah, yes, the converso of Puccini, Otto chimed in. One cannot praise him too much. He pinched her arm and locked his hand around her elbow. She glared at him and shook free. As I was saying before you interrupted me, she turned back to the gaggle of critics. The switchbacks need the proper balance between abandon and control. Herr Lautner accepted a glass of champagne. Perhaps you place too much responsibility on the musicians. Not at all. The musicians can feel the descant build. 
she made a fist and beat three times against her chest. Music must come from the core. Afterwards, she refused to take Otto's arm. Fog from the Danube had settled over the city. Mist glazed the cobblestones and muffled the clip-clop of carriage horses. Despite that, the night was pleasant and warm. She walked with her arms folded over her chest and a clutch tucked beneath her arm. Why on earth did you pinch me? You were angry, he said. So? Otto laughed. I have known well one other hot-headed woman, and I find it wunderbar that you do not disguise your feelings. With such a woman, one always knows where one stands. But in the end, was it not better to flare at me than at Lautner? He cocked his head and smiled. Street lamps sculpted the squared panes of his broad forehead and high cheekbones. Was there something hidden and rigid about him? So, tell me about your wife. Her own kind of verbal pinch. My wife is no more. A German idiom for death. Is nicht mehr. Oh, poor man. When did you lose her? Four years ago. He pulled his chin. No, four and a half. My husband has been dead a year, she said. Ach, so. His parents came from Vienna. What did he do? Martin was a math professor at Columbia. Were you happy? Very. He nodded solemnly. Then you have a long path ahead. He offered his elbow and she took it. Restaurant awnings had been rolled up. Barrel-backed chairs faced each other across empty tables. Shutters on the upper floors had been closed against the damp. Did you find it hard to get on with your life? Certainly, he said. But I told myself it was the same after the war. Time passes and one tries to construct the life alone. And you're all right? Life is for the living. My husband is the only person on earth who truly understood me. Once I would have said the same. But I find now that I can have a good understanding with many more than I imagined. So to say, friends of the heart, nicht wahr? She wanted to ask him more about how he had managed to reconstitute his life, for it was something she knew she should do. Her life had devolved into a list of shoulds. Clean out Martin's closet. Go over to Columbia and arrange for an archivist to comb through his papers. Sit down with an accountant and see where she stood for next year's taxes. All too quickly, they had arrived back at the pension. She turned to face him, and though she was tall, he was taller. Had she known him better, she might have given in to her impulse to rest her head on his shoulder. Instead, she extended a hand. This has been very helpful, Otto. Since my husband's death, I feel my spirit being crushed between a mountain of emotionally draining tasks. Then while you are here, you must have some fun. Perhaps you can go home with some energy to tackle what you must. He placed a hand on her shoulder. Are you still willing for me to play tour guide? Promise I don't have to be in a good mood? Not for me. I have my bad days too. The next day, he informed her that their first stop was a short subway ride away. No one could leave Vienna without seeing the Kunsthistorisches Museum. My husband's parents always talked about that. Art history professors, they had emigrated to America two years before the Anschluss. Martin's dear, dear parents, gone too. And here she was, still smarting from last night's debacle, standing in a room of Flemish miniatures. The museum was famous for its early Renaissance landscapes, farmlands, windmills, dark skies. Hands clasped behind his back, Otto leaned past the stanchions and rope that kept visitors from getting too close. An alarm sounded. She pulled him back. A guard hurried toward them. 
Otto held up his hands. After issuing a warning, the guard returned to an adjoining room. Neva burst into laughter and then clamped a hand over her mouth. Otto, laughing too, looked around guiltily. Did that make you nervous? Well, I don't want my tour guide to get arrested. I only look, never touch. However, let me show you the benefit of standing close. He beckoned her toward the portrait of a cow, and when she stood as close as he wanted her to, details leapt out. Wet nostrils, individual eyelashes, dolorous eyes. All totally realistic, all temptingly touchable, but not. It's the portrait of a soul, she said. Genau. She had passed the test. What's on the agenda for the rest of the day? After the museum and lunch, he proposed a concert at the cathedral. Tickets had already been purchased, so there was no sense her begging off. Organ concerts are my favorite, she said. How did you guess? Your every wish is my desire, he said with a wink and a bow. She smiled. My every wish is your command. That's the way we say it. I don't like to command. I would rather persuade. The crowd surged through the massive wooden doors of St. Stephen's. Inside, a breeze swept through the nave and out the clerestory windows. A bird slapped the wooden beams. She hoped it wasn't trapped. As concertgoers found their seats, all was commotion. The cathedral, where the great Papa Haydn had served as Kapellmeister, was chock-a-block with heavy, carved wood. She felt small and insignificant. Her music, and even her recent inability to compose, diminished by the old man's genius. When she slid into a pew, her leg pressed Otto's thigh. He glanced down, then placed an arm around her shoulder. She shivered with pleasure. A thousand voices gabbled. She took a blank staff book from her purse. How do you write music, he said. I start by thinking of the piece as a table, square, round, oval-shaped, with leaves or without. Such a domestic image. In most ways, I am a very traditional woman. His thumb dug into a knot on her neck. Relax, she told herself. Thanks, she said. That feels good. He placed a hand on her knee. And about the music? What had he asked? All this contact, all this touching. Oh, yes, about how she composed. Let's say I get a commission for a piece 45 minutes long. I imagine an oval-shaped table with no leaves. In the beginning, the table is covered with a lace tablecloth. I can see the dark color of the wood underneath, but nothing of the grain. I have only a sense of the size and shape of the composition. Then, if the patron tells me what feeling the piece should have, I search for the same feeling in myself. What do you do once you know the feeling? I make little rips in the tablecloth, here and here and here. With her fingernails, she opened imaginary holes. To expose bits of wood grain, I begin to see a pattern. I connect the larger holes. Finally, I have a composition. This delights me, he said. Our creative process is very similar. Oh? From an inside pocket, he withdrew a mechanical pencil. May I borrow your notebook? Just until the concert starts. He glanced at the nearby oratory, an elevated crow's nest reached by a winding stair. His pencil drew a vine around the edge of the page. He turned the line into a banister. Frogs with inward-turning toes squatted on the rail. She looked from the drawing to the banister. I didn't see the froggies until you drew them, she said. As with music, details suggest the whole. Moved that he had grasped so quickly the thing that meant the most to her in life, she touched her fingers lightly to her throat. A murmur traveled through the crowd. 
heads crane, looking at the organist, whose keyboard at the side of the cathedral suddenly sparkled with a pinpoint of light. The first heavy chords of the Baroque organ rang out. Bach's powerful B minor toccata resembled a medieval tapestry, notes in the high register weaving like whites and yellows through the mighty purple bass. She allowed the music to press upon her heart and shorten her breath. Tears flowed freely. Otto handed her a handkerchief and dabbed his own eyes with his thumbs. Then it was over. The audience burst into applause. I hope it wasn't too much, he said. Oh, no, she said. It was cathartic. It emptied me out. Otto looked ahead at the tabernacle. The B minor Toccata was my wife's favorite, and this was an extraordinary performance. Unlike last night, she thought. But never mind. No point dwelling on that. Near the exit, he pulled her out of the shuffling crowd. Wait, look here. Display cases on the transept wall held old newspaper articles and black and white photographs. In the images, she saw that the nave of St. Stephen's, where the bird had been flying, had once stood open to the sky. There were blocks of rubble, crushed pews, shattered glass. He put his finger on the single standing arch. This was all we had to work with. This nothing. She looked up at the high vaults. How on earth did you put it all back? Stone by stone. The same way I rebuilt my life. I wish I could believe that were possible. Since my husband's death, I have had no musical ideas. I don't know if I'll ever write again. I hope you will. He took her arm and led her toward the door. Across from the eastern portal of the cathedral, a pyramid of glass bombarded the plaza with brassy light. Neva shielded her eyes. He stepped between her and the glare. Earlier, I had an idea. What kind of idea? She pulled large black sunglasses from her clutch. Now she could think without worry of being blinded. Would you consider writing a commissioned piece for a women's choral group here in Vienna? Not the Schoenberg Choir? The Frauengesangverein. Is it for some occasion? An anniversary, he said. I am on the board. Who is the client, really? Is there a music director? Or will I have to please the whole board? An impossible task, I might add. I've tried before. I am the client, said Otto. You have only me to please. She slipped off her sunglasses. You can't be serious. Indeed, I am. The sun fell behind the roofs. If she landed a new commission, maybe that would get the creative juices flowing. The pension was but a short walk across the square, and these preliminary negotiations generally took time. Tell me more about the group, she said. It's a women's choir of mature voices. An experienced choral group, then. Why don't you judge for yourself? These people are my dearest friends, and tonight we meet for dinner in the Grinzing. Besides, he added, giving her a wink, they might join in sponsoring the commission. Oh, good, I can raise my fee. So you will do it? Let's see how things go. If she was meeting Otto's friends, she needed to shower and change clothes. One more question, she said. How exactly were you able to get on with your life? I had no choice. Do you date? I think of it more as developing friendships. He pushed open the pension's filigreed door. My wife always arranged our free time. If I made no effort, I would find myself sitting home every night. Is it not pleasant to enjoy the company of the opposite sex? She made herself exhale. Yes, certainly. He insisted on accompanying her in the elevator. On the sixth floor, just as she was about to insert the key, he took it from her. Before we go in, 
I have something to ask. Did you bring the red scarf you wore in Salzburg? A shawl, not a scarf. You remember what I wore? You had on slim black pants. Shouldn't I be wearing something more formal? Not at all. Be yourself. Are you going to leave and come back? No, I'll wait in the breakfast room. All right, she said. He opened the door and stood aside, letting her enter. In her room, she saw that the maid had folded Martin's nightshirt and placed it on a pillow. She pressed it against her cheek and consigned it to her suitcase. Just in case. She showered and put on pants and heels. Surely they'd done enough walking for the day. And as she was to do a commission for this group, she wanted to look her best. The tassels of her shawl swung as she trotted down the hall. Beautiful, Otto said. A work of art. Rather than a cab, he suggested the Strassenbahn. How comfortable he seemed with his life as presently constituted. If only she could get there. The tracks quivered and sang. What is this grinsing place? She asked, looking out at the houses with their window boxes of red and white geraniums. So to explain it to you, Grinzing is where Beethoven composed his pastoral. Mahler is buried in the graveyard. Should I have brought a bouquet? We can let the graveyard alone. A bittersweet laugh. Yes, I've had quite enough of graveyards. The connection with Beethoven and Mahler had Neva expecting a grand schloss, but no. Grinzing was a modest village of stucco farmhouses, vineyards spreading beyond the edge of town. The streetcar stopped, and he helped her down the steps. Despite its distance from the city, quite a lot of tourists come here, he said, to look at Mahler's grave for the Hürriger wine. I don't know that word. It is wine from the new harvest, similar to France's Beaujolais Nouveau. He pinched his thumb and index finger. A bit sour, some say. I hate sweet wine. So no Morgan David? That especially. Reserve your verdict. Saying something about wreaths and landmarks, Otto set off down the village street. Cobblestones caught her heels. She had been thinking about the commission, not practical shoes. Wait up, she called. He halted immediately, looking around as if lost. I was trying to recall where Beethoven lived. What am I, your subservient little Japanese wife? He walked back and offered his arm. Without a woman's civilizing influence, we men forget our manners. She tried to keep the weight on the balls of her feet. I wish I'd worn tennies. He slipped an arm around her waist. If you stumble, I will catch you. She smiled. You have impeccable manners. Besides, he made a handsome escort. For two blocks, passing a dozen wineries, she let herself be carried along by his company and the smoky aroma of meat cooked on a rotisserie, and she began to wish that something, not yet daring to be named, could develop from smiles and touches. Finally, he steered her through an arch wide enough for a horse-drawn wagon, a courtyard furnished with two dozen picnic tables open before her. Here we are, Otto announced. Austrian men in business suits and women in apron dirndls hoisted empty pitchers at passing waiters. A stocky man in a green felt country jacket stood and waved. Missing a step, Neva tripped. whoops -a -la. Otto caught her under her arms. Neva straightened herself, but when she looked over at the table, she saw that the smiles had dropped from the faces of the women. They looked her up and down, seemingly taking her measure. The evening was either very warm, or the prickly sensation on her cheeks meant her face was turning red, just when she wanted to come across as cool and assured. Meine Damen und Herren, Otto said to the group, it is my honor to present to you the famous American composer Neva Roth. Neva's scarlet shawl slipped from her shoulders. She busied herself retying the knots so that she did not have to respond to the up-and-down assessments of the men. 
Looking like Audrey Hepburn in her black turtleneck and stretch pants, she had already seen that she was a hundred pounds lighter and ten years younger than anyone else. Why had she come out here with a man she barely knew? Otto seated her next to a Frau Schmidt. After a sidelong glance, Frau Schmidt spoke in a guttural Austrian dialect to the woman opposite, her hair a stiff meringue. If Neva was to have any standing with these people, she would have to jump into the conversation. I understand that you and Herr Hoffmann are old friends. Frau Schmidt turned, drawing her elbows in. Do you speak German? Yes, Neva said. Frau Schmidt switched to Hochdeutsch. Then we can't say bad things about you, can we? The other women laughed. Neva was in no mood to be the butt of their jokes, but knew it would be more diplomatic to deflect. Do you sing with the Frauengesangverein? Once I did, Frau Schmidt refilled her wine glass. Now my voice cracks. Could you tell me how large the group is? Eighty, plus or minus. Are the singers trained? Since we were children, we all sang together. Frau Schmidt drew a circle in the air to incorporate all the tables. This group here. She pointed out who sang which parts in the chorus, when they had joined and when retired. The quality of Frau Schmidt's voice, sharp even in speech, and the gossipy manner in which she raked over each singer's flaws reminded Neva how much she disliked catty women. The man in the green coat stood. Otto removed his tie and stuffed it in his pocket. He squeezed Neva's thigh. Don't disappear. When he left, Frau Schmidt said in a stage whisper, Don't pay attention to Otto. He's just lonely. Frankly, Neva wasn't sure what she felt. Off balance, perhaps. We didn't realize you really were a composer, said the woman with the white bouffant. Greta here, pleased to meet you. She reached across the table, offering a hand. Neva shook it. A pleasure. A woman in an unfortunate lilac pantsuit moved closer. We thought you were another one of Otto's women. Otto's women? Neva said. I don't blame him, said Frau Schmidt. Blame him for what? Neva asked, keeping a stone face and disinterested tone. For taking companions, said the woman in lilac, frowning at Neva as though she were a dimwit. The need for companionship Neva knew well, and she did not blame Otto for beginning to date. Four years was a long time. We went to school with Hildi, said the woman with the hair. Yes, said Frau Schmidt, and she does not recognize any of us. You mean did, do you not? Neva said. Frau Schmidt's heavy eyebrows drew together. She's still alive, in body. Neva looked from one to the other. Smiles dropped from their faces. Does she have, is she in a home for Alzheimer's? Frau Schmidt said. Yes, and for a time when we visited, we could get her to remember our school days. But now, nothing at all. She sits in a wheelchair and whimpers, said the woman with curls. And at night, she screams. Otto can hardly stand to visit. Frau Schmidt said. And you remain his friends? Frau Schmidt shrugged. We have many widows in our circle, and they say he is never disloyal to his wife. Do you understand? Asked the woman in lilac. Neva understood all right. Look, but don't touch. He didn't have sex. Through an open door, she saw him in a line of men, arms crossed, laughing with the other men. His wife was alive. He could sit with her, touch her hand, talk to her. Even if she did not talk back, she was alive, poor woman. And here was Neva with her tight clothes and red scarf, her movie star glasses in her clutch, 
looking to these peasants like a modern-day Carmen, or worse, Jezebel. Carrying two plates, Otto returned. When he lowered hers into view, she gasped at the pile of heavy Austrian fare. Thick slabs of bacon, knocker dumplings, two scoops of potato salad. No wonder the women were fat. The breeze shifted, and a barnyard smell blanketed the patio. Frau Schmidt sniffed. Vat reeks? Yes, indeed. Something was rotten in the state of Denmark, Neva thought. Otto placed a hand on her shoulder, Mr. Touchy-Feely. You must eat, he said. She was surrounded by Aryans. I can't eat this. Why not? Jews don't eat pork, as you undoubtedly know, without me telling you. She cupped her hands around her face. Please don't cry, she thought. Whatever you do, don't make a scene. She threw a leg over the bench. If she could just get some air. He grabbed her arm, but she twisted away, removed her heels, and bolted barefoot through the arch and out to the street, running downhill toward the streetcar stop. Otto caught up just as the streetcar, its bell ringing, opened its doors. She took a window seat and pulled the shawl over her head. Otto slid in next to her. The streetcar was stuffy and overheated. She threw off the shawl and tried opening the window. Unable to budge it, she beat the glass with her fists. Calm down. Otto stood and forced the latch. As the wind whipped her hair, she convinced herself that no man would ever be able to stand her again. She would be miserably alone the rest of her life. She crushed the shawl to her eyes and hunched over, elbows on her knees. Half an hour later, they reached the city proper. She would ignore the barricade of his crossed arms. She could endure it. This situation was minor compared to the other things she had endured. This was very nearly comical. He hadn't said a word the whole way back, and then he stood. Our stop is the next. It's not our stop. It's my stop. If he tried to touch her, she would sock him. But he did not. At the pension, he took out a euro for the elevator. She started for the spiral stairs. As you wish, Gennady Fowl, but I take the elevator. The marble treads felt good on her bare feet. I need the exercise. The elevator rose alongside her. Otto stood in the cubicle as she circled the shaft. On the third floor, she stopped to catch her breath. The platform lifted his feet above her head, and he called down. We did not have time to discuss the commission. Oh, that. Yes, that, he said. The elevator's light cast moving shadows along the wall. The elevator clanged to a halt. Winded and in need of a hot bath, she arrived on the sixth floor. Otto moved slowly from the shadows. We must talk. I'm not doing the music, Herr Hoffmann. I can't. She tried to slip past him, get her key in the lock. The day had done her in. He took her key and closed his fingers around it. Please he said. This anniversary will come only once. Find the Frauen whatever another composer. You misunderstand, he said. It is not for them. Isn't it for their anniversary? It is for mine, he said. The fiftieth of my wedding. The golden one. The hall light clicked off automatically plunging her into darkness. With a blood-curdling scream, the gears of the ancient elevator engaged. Standing very near the stairs, she found herself resisting the downward suck of air and the clank and hiss of a cable lowering the elevator to the lobby. She reached in the darkness for Otto's hand, surprising herself. He caught her wrist and pressed her hand to his heart his breathing that of a man laboring under a heavy load. He wore a subtle pine cologne, and it was that as much as anything. 
that made her slip her arms around his waist. Hugging him was like hugging a tree, straight, solid, resinous. The cashmere of his sweater caressed her cheek. How much time did he have? How much time did she? I thought we both were widowed, she said. The wife I knew is dead, and I would throw myself at your feet if I thought it would convince you to undertake my commission. I want a memorial to show how marriage makes a common history. I had hoped to give you some idea of what my wife was like before the disease. Her friends have memories I do not. But I ran out. It was not because you are Jewish. Neva drew back. His face blurred in the dark. I ran because you were not free. A spasm passed down his body. And you are. He stepped back, one relationship between them extinguished, the other as client and patron still possible. I so hope, I pray, you can make my idea a reality. I'm sorry, Herr Hoffman. I truly can't. Well, then. He clicked his heels and bowed. Clutching the iron rail, he started down the stairs. Neva listened to the diminuendo of his steps. Back in the room, she dropped her shoes by the door. Her notebook lay where she had tossed it on the bed. She pulled a chair to the desk and turned on the lamp, like the illustration on an illuminated manuscript. Otto's drawing twined around the border of the page. Treble notes filled the staffs. Could she actually have started something new? She flipped the page. Not Bach, exactly but a theme. She opened a drawer and found a pen. Around and through Otto's drawing, she parted the lace. The sound of wedding sprang from the page. The beginning of love and its end. She heard voices singing. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to just uh, talk a little bit about what you think are your essential things. Oh, family, family, family. Those are my essential things. You know, and I, of course, the other thing is probably essential for me is I just love to write. And I love to make things, you know, I love to make things with my hands. I was a carpenter for a long time. And I, I really liked seeing the product of my creativity. And, and that's true, whether it's a second story edition on a, on, a, on a house or whether it's holding a book that I've created. You know, there's a physicality to creation yes. that is very rewarding to me. Yes. But primarily it's family. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, my identity is, is two things. One is as a mom and the other is as a creative person, you know, and I think the creative person part has to do more with just, you know, the me exp self-expression. The mom is, is just intrinsically who I am and, you know, what much of my life has been about. She shares so much about her life in her book, Surrender, about being widowed in her 20s. Yes, widowed. And about the reunion with her birth family and the son she surrendered, which, of course, molded her perspective on nature and nurture and love. And after I found my birth family, yes, the DNA is extremely important. It's an extremely tight bond. Uh, in, in my son's case, absolutely. I mean, he has the same father my other children have. And he's very, very like them in personality and looks and laugh. It's wonderful that you, you share that 
instant sort of connection and common bond, even without yeah. the common history, that that's a innate sort of feeling. Um, well, it's a feeling of love. I mean, of just yeah. total love. And, um, you know, it's, I think any mother feels, you know, just because I didn't get to raise him uh, doesn't make that feeling go away. And I, I just feel total love for him. Yes. As I do for my other children. Yes. Yeah. It was really a pleasure to meet you and get to talk to you about it more in depth. Thank you. Yeah, I feel for, like we, for could, that. we could talk longer too. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, yes, it's nice to connect with someone that enjoys sharing and telling stories. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining me in the Zoom world. Yes, thank you very much for, for making this possible. It's been really great. Thank you. Okay, have a great rest of your day. All right, bye-bye. Mary Lee devotes a lot of her energy to helping other writers. I'll put a link to her website in the show notes. You can also find all her books there. I'll also link to narrator Adam Barr's website so you can hear more from him. Thanks for listening.